Good morning. Hello and welcome. My name is Carolyn Pears. I'm Operations Manager at Doctors in Distress, and I'm here today with my colleague Aileen Crombie, and we'll be running the webinar together. I'd like to welcome you to this webinar and tell you a little bit before we start about Doctors in Distress. We're an independent charity and we provide healthcare support to all healthcare professionals across the UK. We have various programmes, including peer support and webinars such as this. And we also campaign for better working conditions for healthcare professionals. Now, during this session today, we will be taking questions and we'll ask them, answer them at the end. So if you have any questions during the session, do put them in the chat. We will be recording this. And for anyone who hasn't been able to attend and you think may be interested, do share the video later. Uh, this will be on YouTube and we'll send you the link. We would encourage everybody to follow us on social media too, if you can. Now, our speakers today are Professor Subod Dave, and he will be speaking with Doctors in Distress Ambassador Sarinda Vitatonge. This will be a interview type session and it will be the sharing of personal experiences of mental illness so we thank Sarinda particularly for being so open about this so thank you everyone and I'd now like to hand you over to our speakers hi thank you thank you so much um and Sarinda I can't see you on screen I'm just going to try and adjust my screen so that yeah I can see you now that's great Apologies, uh, everyone, I was a little bit late and I think probably scared some of you because uh, trains were really running late. Um, <clears throat> but uh, it's a real pleasure to be hosting the Doctor One and Four seminar by Doctors in Distress. Um, uh, so I don't know whether, Carolyn, you were able to tell a bit about Doctors in Distress or not, but uh, did you say anything about no? Yeah, I, okay. I yeah I did I did do a brief introduction, a little bit about the charity. So yes, I have I have done that. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, so you you heard about the charity, and I think it's really really about trying to promote um, uh, well being and and good mental health and good physical health amongst doctors. Um, um, we, we if you have time, I'm sure we uh, there might be some questions about the charity itself. So feel free to use the chat and the Q and A box for for that. Um, I think I really wanted to focus on on three things. I think when I started the whole Doctor One and Four program in Derbyshire, it was um, with the realization that um, for all of us, if we wanted to go to a building site, and there's one right in front of me now, and there are people in hard hats, um, so none of us would be allowed to go on a building site without a hard hat. Uh, that's the health and safety law in this country, and in pretty much in every every other country. Uh, that has, uh, you know, proper regulations in place. Um, and yet I think we've somehow allowed ourselves to be in a culture where medicine is a profession where pretty much all of us are guaranteed to come across mobility, mortality, stress, long working hours, odd working hours, shift pattern of working, all of these factors which are known to be associated with ill health, both physical and mental ill health. Um, and yet we don't have we assume that people will just muddle through it, you know, that we, we haven't really created an equivalent of a hard hat. And so um, that's, that's with that in mind, I think I started the Dr. One and Four program, also knowing that campaigns that have tried to address issues around mental health, saying one in four, et cetera, have failed to, to recognize that um, doctors, in fact, um, and healthcare workers as well, more broadly, are in fact more vulnerable than than one in four, you know, uh, and then so early recognition is important, and the earlier we're able to recognize, uh, recognize and intervene, the better are the outcomes. Um, and finally, I think I think um, how we normalize um, conversations about mental health in the workplace. So those are kind of the three main broad goals that we're hoping to cover in today's um, seminar, and re really pleased to have. Um, Sarinda here, Sarinda was, um, um, uh, well, I'll let Sarinda introduce himself. Um, um, and so if, if you're okay, we're gonna have a conversation between Sarinda and myself and uh, a lot of the interaction about Sarinda will, will come through that. But um, so if that's uh, all right, Sarinda, we can make a beginning now. 
Yeah. And welcome. And first of all, thank you very much for participating in this um, conversation. Uh, cool. We did this uh, a few months ago and it was very well appreciated. People were really grateful for your insights and, and you opening up. So, so if, if I may start, I mean, I think um, maybe let's start with um, um, your journey in medicine. Yeah, how, how, sure. did you, how did you decide to enter medicine? Yeah, so um, I think um, I think just as a context, I'll, I'll give a brief introduction. So I um, I was an F2. So this is um, for those who are, may not be in medical school at the moment, that is the second year of being a junior doctor. So I, I resigned recently um from from that role due to um due to a mental health crisis um at the time of working during during one of the last um one of the last peaks of the pandemic and since then i've been looking to get into work um in the occupational health sphere i'm currently working with the chair of doctors in distress um claire gerardo on a textbook which is um it's going to be called the handbook of physician mental health um, so really looking at the stats, the reasons for a doctor's mental illness and what we can do to, to tackle it. Um, and I've been, it's an absolute privilege to be involved with, as an ambassador with this charity, Doctors in Distress. Um, and we ran this program with international medical graduates who are, who are new to the NHS. And it went down really well. And I think conversation, which I'll have with Subo, will really reflect how we can actually have these conversations informally amongst ourselves and how this can be modeled elsewhere. So, um, um, so Sarinda, thanks again for being here um, and, um, you know, for being an ambassador for Doctors in Distress. I really, really appreciate uh, the efforts you've put in, in this field. Um, so we've, we've seen a lot of people putting lots of words uh, yeah. and emotions in there. Um, I want to start with feelings, you know, things so are, how, how did you feel when you joined medicine? When I joined medicine, I was, well, this was, God, back in, God, I don't even actually remember when, what year it was, but I was. Don't, don't say back, back in, because I'm much older than you. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> not, I keep not forgetting idea. that. <laughs> medicine is a six year program in most cases now. And it back then when I first started at the at the beginning of the, the conveyor belt, I was very hopeful. I was I was actually really happy that I got in. I was really looking forward to the university life. I was actually looking forward to to um, be able to work one day in the sector which I had done work experience in. And I mean, in the end, although we can't necessarily say it in interviews, but you want to help people. And that is what the job is all about. And I wanted to help people. And um, I, mean, I don't want to introduce a different angle uh, to the whole conversation, but I mean, it's something that I've come across that uh, being uh, of salvation descent, sometimes uh, there's, a, there's a suggestion that um, you are almost exposing yourself to stress because you might have been pushed into the, into the, into the profession, uh, this pressure from the family. Is that something that you identified with? Was that something relevant in your case? Um, to be perfectly honest, it was it was very relevant in my case. Um, as much as it it was natural for me go, to go down this path with my, um, you know, my wanting to help people anyway, as well as my, um, I guess my um, natural instincts for the sciences and, and human biology, there was there was a significant uh, push into medicine. Not that it was the only subject in university to do, nor was it a series of options. But from my parents' point of view, it was the best option. It was for them. It was natural that oh, he's good at he's good at these subjects at A level. Well, medicine, of course. Now, <laughs> when when you're suggested with such options and you investigate it yourself, it does take an add on that opportunity to rationalize their own decision making so yes i was encouraged in fact quite strongly encouraged but it was a decision which i took in the end amongst amongst other options like politics german um, amongst other things so uh, i chose medicine which is a very very different thing um and my parents are i mean 
I'm so grateful to them because they paid all my tuition fees. So it's, and they, they, they are horrified with the concept of me even thinking about paying them back in the future. And that is something which, I mean, I am, it's, it's such a humbling experience to, to have that, that amount of support on my side. But as well, I guess we'll discuss later, it brings some implications to, to how I approach medicine as well. Thanks, Linda. So you were joining with a lot of enthusiasm. And I think typically, I think we, we know the statistics that said, uh, definitely about empathy, it is said that pretty much every medical student is full of empathy when they join. And then somewhere along the journey, uh, for quite a few of them, that empathy gets beaten out of them. Um, did that, does that resonate with you? Did, did you see that happening? I mean, um, do you, do you recognize it looking back or had you recognized it even then? So I think you recognize it early on in medical school. Now, back, I'll try not to say back when, but the curriculum I had was very traditional still. It was still the two years preclinical, which is mainly lecture, seminar, tutorial based. And only from the third year was a, purely placements, purely clinical placements you're involved in the hospital. Either way, the volume of work was intense. I mean, you, but it's something you get used to. However, it's, I'll be honest, um, it wasn't too much of a change from what I had to do to get into medicine in the first place. And I think this is where some of the problems actually do lie is how do we select medical students? And I, and I felt that actually my natural perfectionism, my natural, my natural um, uh, obsession with getting good marks and doing the best I can and completing everything, it, it just fits the mold for completing the first two years of medical school to the extent where, uh, uh, I say this not as a way of boasting, but my, my nature kind of helped me to get uh, distinctions within the first couple of years. And I was, I was flying, I felt so good. Um, I was not only you know, doing what I need to do to study, but I was very much out and about like two, three days a week, um, just constantly, I was constantly out. I, I absolutely loved life in the first two years of medicine. But then again, with the traditional course I had, um, and I studied at King's College London, you weren't open to the clinical world just as yet. Yeah. Right, well, that's quite different too. I think for me, I think as you, as you quite rightly said, it's full of medicine is, is quite strange, isn't it? Because suddenly you come across people who's, who are all as good as you have been you know, or even better than you have been, you know? And because most, of, most people who go into medicine have generally been doing quite well at school. And then when you come in, it's, it's a little bit of a pressure cooker environment. And I, I remember failing in my first year, the first time failing ever, and kind of feeling, my God, uh, oh, just experiencing fa failure was, was such, a, such a downer. So it looks like you, you kind of negotiated that well. So what changed? I mean, I think in terms of, because I think, you know, we hear all these, especially nowadays, I think there's so much talk of stress and burnout and well-being and, and there are lots of well-being classes. And in fact, so much so that uh, people sometimes get put off by, by even the mention of the phrase well-being. Um, did you have anything of that sort then? Did you kind of notice that something was changing in the way you felt about yourself? Absolutely. Um, and I think this all coincided nicely with when I first started clinical placements. The very first time I, I went to a placement, I had a consultant gastroenterologist just take us, take me and my, me and my mate into the room and say, boys, why are you doing this career? You need to get out now. And that was the first wake up call. Um, wake up call, um, alarm bell moment where I'm thinking, oh goodness, have I, have I chosen correctly? What have I exactly have I signed myself up to? It proceeded to be the best rotation I have, the very first rotation. And I still love medicine and I, I, just didn't agree whatsoever with that consultant because I couldn't see at all how it could be um, 
could be um, what we will later describe perhaps as difficult, as challenging, as, and we'll explain more about that. Um, I, I certainly encountered the level of competition in medical school. And I think this is where it all, this is where it all starts. When you're, it didn't help that <laughs> there were a few data leaks in my medical school, but it, it certainly doesn't help when you're put on a, a decile ranking and medical students being very competitive, having come from very competitive backgrounds in the first place, are openly discussing where they've come within the year group. Now, this gets everyone's back up because when you hit, start hitting those years, you start to realize the implications of those rankings. It's not just pass or fail, it's the better you do in med school, the more likely you are to get a geographical location of your choice, a set of jobs more towards your choice, both of which will affect what specialty you perhaps choose in the future. So competition, the implications of success, the implications of failure, produces a real fear. It, I think that's, that's what, what it kind of instilled in me um, during, during that third year. And moving from third year into, into my uh, integrated BSc year, I could feel myself um, just slugging away at exams, really losing myself in work and not losing complete interest in what I had been doing, sports, music, etc. cetera, um, going out, meeting friends, even talking to my family um, uh, during, during those years. And this was also the time when I actually moved out of my home and I was living in London itself. So at that time, I did lose a lot of my support network, both self-inflicted, frankly, but also geographically. Um, there were also some family circumstances which, um, and relationship circumstances, which you know, um, were quite painful to deal with. The nail in the coffin at that point was when I started to lose grades. And as someone who's of a perfectionist, obsessional nature, at least at that time, that was very hard to take. That was me failing, in my opinion. And this is not, and this is someone who, you know, achieves 80s, high 80s, high 90s, like just as a focus, and I would not be happy for 1% less. I was way, way underneath my own standards. And this is not saying that I wasn't passing, I was failing my own standards. Because in my opinion, my own standards is how I want to practice as a doctor. To do the best of the patient means that you've got to know everything, you've got to, you've got to be as good as possible. Um, that was the start of, I guess, a, a big decline. Yeah, and I think you mentioned that you moved away from home and then started withdrawing in yourself. And I think those are things that many people will recognize, I think, because university life often involves that. But then in medicine, as you get busier, it also means that you, you cut out a lot of other social support that you have, your school friends, you stop meeting them as often, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, looking back, Sandra, do you feel that you ever recognized uh, that this was not something which is, sort of, you know, that this was something out of normal, you know, or did you just feel that you were reacting to circumstances and that is what it was? Because I think that's what tends to happen a lot in, in my experience. Certainly, I've, I've seen a lot of colleagues uh, who come to me for help. I'm a psychiatrist. I work as a psychiatrist. And I think um, sometimes years have elapsed before people have recognized that this is something which is not quite uh, their usual self, you know. Uh, what about you? When did you, did you recognize it then? Or, or was it much later? <clears throat> In the immediate stages, I basically palmed off these feelings. Uh, compartmentalize and push them back saying no, you can't think about that you just have to crack on okay fine failed next exam will be okay the problem is is that those feelings never go away they're just they're just pushed further back it's not really dealing with the source of those feelings and in the um in the end 
what happened was day by day, you start getting up later and later. You start, well, that's partly because you start waking up at random times in the middle of the night. Sometimes it's difficult to get to sleep. And sometimes you wake up in the morning and it just couldn't be bothered going to, to placement. I, I just didn't have the energy. And I thought at that time, well, what's the point? What's the point of me going? I'm gonna, there were thoughts running in my head, like you're gonna fail anyway. You're, you know, you're not really learning anything here on the other, on the other ear. And I tried to kick myself out of, out of bed. I forced myself into placement. I felt like at times I'd walk around like a zombie, like a corpse, just, just existing, like on the wards. It was lonely. Um, and I got, I certainly got a kick out of exercising at the time as well. So I was running two to three 10 Ks a week, followed by some pub nights as well. So it was, I threw myself into exercise. I threw myself into, you know, social events to kind of kickstart some feeling because I think a good, a good word to summarize how I felt was numb going through, going through, um, especially third year and coming in, um, coming into the BSC year even, which was different. Um, and then I found there was at one point, um, I, I told my parents about this and how, you know, I just haven't been going. And um, I think this is a big thing because as you mentioned, our Southeast Asian heritage, it, it wasn't helpful at that time for me to mention these sort of things because um, at least from where I'm from, it's not, and I don't hold anything against my parents, but it's mental health is not something which is talked about at all, um, especially from the culture where I'm, I'm from. Depression equals lazy is a way you can summarize it. Um, and they can understand. And actually, it took my mom to somehow, you know, through Google, find out, are you depressed? And this is someone who never thought they could be depressed. And I, I had to strongly consider it and I said yes well actually I think so um but at that point I felt like a failure and this is worse because you're not only you're not only flopping in the actual medical school um exams placements not turning up you're also you feel like even more of a failure due to that illness um and it's it just turned medical school into an experience which is like some of the words we can see here um, fearful, disheartening, powerless, helpless. That that that's what happened effectively. I, I turned into I turned into just I felt like a walking corpse, just just numb and just felt pointless. Gosh, I mean two two things pop into my head as you say all this. You know, one is that you, you sound like it was a terribly lonely place for you at the time. I mean, uh, and then you were desperately trying to kind of get out of that loneliness, trying to find some social interaction. Um, but also that bars that you set for yourself that you mentioned in relation to your academic performance looks like there were similar high standards in terms of your own personal performance, if you like. So the f it wasn't just your academic performance, but the fact that you were depressed, that also kind of felt that you, you, you'd failed again and then failed at a bar. Um, I just wanted to pick up on something that you've mentioned. I think maybe I'll unpack it a little bit because, and, and maybe I want to involve the audience at this point as well. I think you mentioned compartmentalize. And I wonder how many people kind of really chime with that. Because I, again, I've seen that very, very commonly amongst doctors as, as a group, I think uh, we, we, we are driven, ambitious, uh, you know, uh, I mean, these are general, I'm generalizing a little bit, so not everyone is necessarily like that, but uh, as a group characteristic, I think, um, and then, and uh, we are curious, and then we like to intellectually solve things. Um, and the compartmentalizing kind of sounds like that you are intellectually dealing with it. I mean, you said that I, your mom had to Google, are you Google? And then you reached, are you, you know, and then you said, yeah, I'm depressed. Now, you see, I'm depressed. Was that a feeling? Was that an intellectual conclusion you'd reached? That, yeah, these are my symptoms. This is how, this is what's happening. Or had you internalized that 
and and you know had some kind of an emotional resonance with the term i think emotions had gone so haywire at the, at the point that i think it was purely intellectualization and i think this is it's an extremely important point. I was actually trying to find the word into like intellectualization when um, when I said compartmentalize. It's in order to do the job we do, in order to perform, um, even as a medical student, even to diagnose, even to learn how to take a history from someone who's in pain and suffering, you do have to you you connect with that person. That I mean, we 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 all have an innate empathy. Some feel it more than others, and some connect with patients more than others, and um, I mean, it, it's shown it at least in the, the research I'm doing that the people, that the students and the doctors who tend to empathize more with their patients who take on their pain and suffering. We're going to a little bit of psychoanalysis here, but it's once you do that, you're able to, you feel like you can understand the patient more. The histories become a little bit more natural. You start asking the questions which become more conversationalist, at least from one to another, and it enables you to find that. You know the right plan you're working with the patient the problem is is that well there's got to be an outlet there's got to be an outlet for these emotions you've got to discuss this um psychology trainees or even psychologists themselves they have weekly supervision time to to discuss various emotions various challenges evoked in their day-to-day -day consultations psychiatry trainees have balling groups schwartz rounds which are basically peer support groups that they can openly discuss these things. Um, when you don't have that, your only tool to cope is intellectualization. It is putting these into your internal um, logic models, your flow models to say, okay, right, this patient's got this sign, this symptom. It, it's, it's leading up to our diagnosis of whatever, right? I've got to do this, this, this. And you emotionally distance yourself from the situation because it is emotionally damaged. It is, it's painful. It is painful. But the problem is, is that when you don't recognize it, you do not seek emotional support. And this is where emotional support comes in too. And why, you know, why I'm involved with doctors in distress as well is that even those people who do feel you know feel the pain feel the suffering are willing to talk there's there's a significant number who do not know where to go to broach about how to broach getting help how to where to seek who to talk to um and i think we we then come on to um where the role of stigma plays in later on and this happened i think stigma really plays a role towards the latter stages of medical school especially mm -hmm. Last few years of being a, a junior doctor. I want to come to that in a minute, Sarinda, but before that, I'm still interested in the internal things because I think for most of us, the stigma is a factor, but there are lots of internal barriers, I feel, in seeking help. And I think you mentioned intellectualization. I think there might be many colleagues here thinking that, well, is surely all of these stresses are part and parcel of medical life. That's what you signed up to. Um, if you did that as a drop of a hat, if all of us started taking, you know, um, didn't intellectualize or, or started getting in touch with our emotions and, and started seeking help, will we just not mean it? Will it not just mean that the system will completely collapse and crumble? Um, do you have an answer to that question based on your experiences? I mean, does it actually help seeking help, or or does it kind of worsen your helplessness? Yeah, I think when I, when I mentioned stigma, it's well, we got two types, don't we? You got the you only got the external environment which makes any sort of disclosure of mental illness a problem, but then there's also the internal side of it where you feel that sense of shame even talking about a weakness, and that frankly is whether it be a mental health problem, whether it be even a physical health problem, um, it's it is exposing a vulnerability and it, and it is a weakness. You don't want to, you don't want to seem like you are, you know, um, a, a difficulty to anyone. You don't want to feel like you are, you know, a, pro a problem case. Um, 
it even goes towards if, even if there is a genuine problem in your education or even in the system, for example, you don't want to raise it because out of fear, it, you end up through, it's, it becomes a vicious cycle where your, you know, your performance drops, you feel worse, sleep goes, your performance drops even worse, even more so, you're not getting the help you need, but then you're not able to broach, the, you're not even able to touch that fact that you need help you, you just you ref, you even refuse sometimes i mean that's where you either minimize the problem or you deny it deny it outright and i think our personalities are shaped throughout medical school where we develop these psychological defenses so intellect intellectualization is one of them um it's it's also minimizing any sort of problem that you feel like you're 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 dealing with internally and flat out denial at its at its worst but if, when you deny a problem you're not acknowledging and you're not you're not dealing with it there seems to be a perceived like invulnerability to mm -hmm. uh, to any sort of mental health issue at least i think that sense of shame and stigma is is, is really quite important and i think i think and in many ways, as you said, quite rightly, it also applies to some physical health problems. I think, you know, um, uh, I think I mentioned this to you before, but uh, just to share with everybody else, I think uh, a couple of years ago, I, I had to be on crutches for a bit. And when I was walking around the corridors of the hospital, over the few days that I was on crutches, about 50 people must have stopped me asking me what happened, you know, and, and really curious, really kind of, you know, uh, supportive, of why are you, why are you at work, that sort of a thing. Um, I had actually, you know, I think we said that we were sometimes there's stigma, but uh, when I lost someone, a close colleague to me, I, I did actually email my team of 70 just to let them know that I was quite upset about the bereavement. And, and only two people kind of responded to my email. I think it just kind of shows how there's a reluctance to engage in, in conversations at work about this. Nothing. And I've also seen that around some physical health issues. I had a friend who went through a uh, you know, after a chronic um, IBS-related uh, problems, had to have colostomy and a colostomy bag. And I think she had a similar experience, found it quite difficult to talk about the issue of coming to work with a colostomy bag, you know, I think it was quite a difficult conversation to have. How do we get into this kind of scenarios? We are medics. These kind of conversations should be difficult for us, right? I mean, w w why do you think that happened? I mean, did you find them difficult at work talking about your own issues? Um, I only ever talked about my own issues in work when they became an issue, like big, big issue, a problem where I had to take sick leave, where, um, where you know, uncharacteristically for me, I was making mistakes mm. to document things. And I think if I had and the signs were there to recognize even through you know, even through F1 and F2 the signs were there to recognize to stop to appreciate right I actually you know need to take a step back for a little bit and then we then come back mm -hmm. um you it, it's the it's the classic keep calm carry on attitude which unfortunately we all have and you know sometimes um, even when I'm feeling good and we medics are guilty of um, perpetuating a culture of not looking after each other either, not looking out for um, signs in each other when someone's turning up late, when someone's cynical about work, etc. But these are all these are all, you know, key signs of, of burnout. And, you know, it, if if someone is very quiet in a, a ward round or ward round, the first I mean now I mean if I was to go back I'd be thinking that's not he or she's normally talkative um they you know they they normally contribute to these things I would be approaching them now with with this level of insight that I have but back then it was you don't you don't think about these you, you don't think about these things at all but I guess we never were educated in these things either. We never had um, avenues for um, support, 
especially during COVID when everyone, everyone and the mother was getting sick and, you know, just going out of sick leave. There was no <laughs> support, wasn't even a thing. It was, yeah, I, I, it was very lonely, uh, depersonalizing experience. I'm aware of the time and I want to try and pull this together. And I think we know that, um, I, I'll just quote the statistics for, for medical students now. I think we know that um, the incidence of mental illness in medical students is three times higher than that of comparable students in other branches of, of, of study. Um, and yet the rates of help seeking are very, very low. And we also know that when people do seek help, the outcomes are, are very good. Um, you kind of outlined the reasons why people don't, don't seek help. Um, but there are consequences of not seeking help as well, isn't it? I think maybe some people muddle through, but we've all seen the sad, sad stories. I mean, especially the last couple of weeks have been very difficult. And I know uh, people in the audience today, you might have followed those stories of... Um, um, from the University Hospital of Birmingham, and then there have been other other stories, sadly, which have all been in the news recently. Um, did you kind of have any personal experience yourself, Sarinda, which brings home uh, some of these sad stories where doctors and other healthcare professionals have been pushed to the wall, you know, feeling that life's not worth living, in some cases, you know, actually trying to end their life. I think this probably leads on to a good discussion of early intervention um, in, in, a, in a little bit. But yes, to answer your question twice, once in medical school, found myself on the ed edge of train tracks. Um, you know, <laughs> actually what stopped me was uh, seeing a family of foxes on the other side of the, the fence. Um, kind of woke me up. I went to a &E. Luckily, my supervisor was an a &E consultant, booked me in and got treated from there and had a year out. Love final year. Two years later down the line, um, was working in a &E during second wave. I can't even remember what the waves were, but um, I had made a plan um, and I was working in, in camps. Um, for those who don't know what uh, that is, that's child and adolescent mental health. And there was a two week period where I was euphoric because I had planned the end of my life. And I, I wanted to, 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 leave, to leave the world. I felt I was going to a place that was better because it was, you know, I felt so pointless and felt that my life was so meaningless that no matter what I did in terms of work, life, um, nothing good would come out of it. So, um, in the end, um, I was caught um, and I spent two weeks in, a, in an adult mental health unit, um, which really brought some perspective to things. It really, you were there rock bottom with a few other, few other gentlemen who, when you looked in their eyes, you could see that they've also done the same thing. Um, and having been a patient of this, the system as well, um, navigating my way back out by community mental health and now back to a place where I'm actually talking about it there is a great deal of insight which can be gained now so that we can recognize signs much earlier on and for you know any prospective juniors whether you be in final year or you know you're going to be a junior in two to three years time um, the, re the repercussions of not looking after yourself are extremely dire um, and it can happen at any stage of your career we've we've heard about gp gp partners we've heard about psychiatrists we've heard about all different specialties and all different um categories of trainee um who have unfortunately taken a way out and it's extremely important to understand what we can do about it as well and I think this is where it's a good idea maybe to talk about you know doctors in distress and actually what can be modeled and what can be done so 
sorry, my mic was playing up. Sorry, said that was quite, um, uh, you know, sad to even hear about this. And I think it's difficult to imagine what you were going through. But it struck me that you said that you felt euphoric in your second wave and you you can't decide. And I think for some that may, some will probably understand it and identify with it, for some it might strike as a bit strange. Do you just want to talk a little bit more about that to what leads to that stage? I mean, is it a stage where you feel that you finally reach some kind of a solution? Because this is not an uncommon thing. It's, it's often described that that colleagues around you, family around you have no idea because you appear so normal. Uh, internally, you do know what's happened. And I'm reminded of the story of um, the, pre, you know, the president of the Royal College of Obstetrics, uh, ex-president uh, uh, in Australia and New Zealand, who, who has described his experiences of kind of almost the same time as you were, I think, early on in his, his career and foundation training when he was all about to, you know, he'd got his medicines ready and everything. And then and, and what stopped him in your case was a family of foxes on one occasion. In his case, it was a knock on the door uh, from someone else. I think showing that there, that even at that late stage, an intervention can help. Um, but you can tell us a bit more about what was going on in your mind? Could, I mean, and what actually did intervene in your case? How did you, you said you got caught. What, what happened? How did you end up in hospital? What, what intervened? What is that pivotal moment that saved things? So... Firstly, to explain uh, euphoric, it's it's beyond feeling. It's beyond feeling. It, it's like you go. I went to the place so deep, so dark, so numb that uh, I had worked a way out. I had solved. I had solved all problems by planning my own demise in two weeks' time. To the extent where I had actually planned a, a work night out. As my last, my last send up, my last, my last party, I guess. And in the two weeks leading up to demise, I was actually, um, I was quite high functioning. I got, in that time, I got a clinical excellence award, which is strange. But this is also at the same time as me, with the children in the in the mental health unit, rolling up my scrub bottoms, putting on high top shoes, rolling up my sleeves, and. You know, when they had music on in one of the in one of the rooms, dancing with them. Now, some people would say, yes, you, you could do a mental state examination whilst dancing with with some children. And I still did the work, but it's obviously not a, um, a normal way to act and behave. And certainly not for me. Certainly it was out of the ordinary. One would describe it as. Hypermanic, if, if you're if we're going into detail here. Um, and the level of planning that I went in with involving train tracks again was detailed. It was planned, time of a train and everything. The person who I was with the following morning um, of that party, um, where I had drunk a lot of alcohol, um, just don't eat, don't, sort of, well, I don't even remember the, the night itself. It's something that slipped in conversation. Um, I, I think I may have said something like, well, it won't be a problem soon anyway, to which the person I was with clocked onto and would not leave my side until I had spoken with my parents and gone to a and &E. um, At that time, I felt I actually was angry because I had this all planned. And then I went sad and realised it, it was a... Cliche to have a roller coaster of emotions at that point. And then it suddenly dawned on me thinking, what on earth am I doing? So I remember crying in AE saying, Look, I really need help. Please help me. My parents mm. helped me. They didn't want to leave my side because I was trying to run onto the road and end up in the mental health unit. Um, uh, yeah, it's, I think it's quite hard to described the feeling of euphoria in mm -hmm. but there was it was a false sense of hope that's it and there's a step you take where it's almost like you are courageous even though it's not really courage in the in the truest sense of the word it's 
a sort of courage where you're overcoming the fear of your own life mm. that you feel that you're brave enough and that you've like you've conquered it and that's how I felt leading up leading in those last two weeks that's why it felt so good because it mm. it was I wanted to to go that was that was what I felt so the work um so doctors in distress does is very much about stopping suicides you know and identifying identifying these problems early you've given us some pointers as to how people could do a bit better in terms of recognizing things early seeking help early um you also mentioned that you didn't quite know where to seek help uh where would you tell people to seek help now I mean what are if you're in the training or working in a hospital where do you seek help especially perhaps where if you're not even sure whether you need help you know um and where you are a bit bit unsure so insight is a great is a great thing and talking with people who are very open to this sort of conversation we all have friends like this is the first point in my opinion to be able to talk with another fellow doctor just anyone any one of your peers about how things are going in medical school how things are going on the job and really and queuing in as if you were talking to a patient on the like a mental state examination seeing where words are not being said seeing where there are pauses and hesitations and just saying are you sure are you okay doc right that's that's where it starts with if you feel like you need help then your colleagues your peers your supervisors these are the people who you should be approaching um these are the people who you can bring with there there's a fear about repercussions and whether there's let me I'll, if I tell you my circumstances i i when i came to raise this with my supervisors i was given full year off all my tuition fees were 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 hot, were held um i didn't have to pay anything extra and i was allowed back in supported return and everything so there's a genuine fear of repercussions in medical school i'm glad to see that health education england as a term to the junior doctor i've got supported return to work now so things are moving on so if we can if you put aside the fear of repercussions and say that and what i hope my story has shown that actually you need to look after number 1 you need to be responsible for yourself before you're responsible for other patients that that is that's a big that's a that is a huge positive that will take you far in i guess in any career peer support groups are the other thing um which i would thoroughly recommend and doctors in distress they run several of these i've been a part of part part mm. of cool and you get to talk really talk with and actually do various things like writing workshops with people who are like minded who are also seeking help and are they able to express themselves in diff- in different ways it's not just speaking about emotions it's actually sometimes writing poems or writing scripts about how you're feeling about your experiences it's starting to break down that barrier of talking very openly and i think another thing is you yourself need to look out for the other people it's we all have a responsibility here to mm. to each other if you see that one of your teammates is, is that they're, they're not taking on enough work they're not um or they are they're not talking much or that they look like they're struggling they look like they're you know, sunk in eyes lack of sleep talk to them it's 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 a strength to be able to recognize in your colleagues because if you're able to recognize it in yourself you're able to recognize it in colleagues again if you're responsible for yourself you can be responsible for not the health of your colleagues but at least for trying to acknowledge that maybe something is not quite um not quite right with them just just the same as if we as we notice these things in our in our patients you know, i mean mm. doctor we're trained patients only <laughs> that's pretty much how it works in our culture um but, but i think i think that's a good point isn't it because the standards that we would apply to others and i'm sure that most people would say that if somebody was struggling they would ask them to take time off and look after themselves and that's what they would advise their patients that's what they might even advise their friends and family 
I think you probably find it hard to apply those standards to yourself. And I think um, trying, trying to be consistent about the standards you apply to people and to yourself I think is a good place to start. I think um, what you mentioned about being open, I think is important. Being open at least to someone, I think, because it's um, sometimes it's difficult and I appreciate that, but uh, maybe a GP, uh, if not a GP, there are counseling helplines that are run by their employer organization that are anonymous. Uh, lots of the role colleges, including mine, uh, the role college psychiatrists, we, we run a psychiatric support service, which are confidential helplines. Uh, most employers run them, the BMA runs uh, helpline. And even if you're not a member, you can still, still access it for free. So I think at least trying to talk things through with um, with 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 someone who who is trained to listen, I think is helpful. Um, at least to work out whether you need more specialist help. And thing, and of course within the organization, there's always a professional support unit. If you are in the training pathway, there's occupational health. If you are an employee, uh, and I think those are also useful places to seek help. Um, but yeah, I think I think for what you say is that kind of just bottling it in doesn't necessarily always lead to lead to uh, answers I think and that sometimes as as in your case can actually have rather devastating consequences I mean I'm glad that things have turned out okay for you would you say that they are okay because I think sometimes people think that well if you're not doing this if you're not not done medicine not done thing then these things are not okay I mean there isn't a set path for everyone is there I think I think we all are unique individuals right and um we shouldn't be expecting that everybody will be on the same treadmill, but yet somehow there's a sense that unless you've kind of got off where the, the path is going out, you're not okay. What would you say to that, Sarinda? Everyone in medicine is on a is on a journey. It and even when you're a consultant, you're still on a journey, and you probably understand. Very much so. Best of all, everyone is on a journey, and it doesn't it doesn't matter if you take time out. Some people take three, four years out and come back as a trainee. It doesn't matter. You, you, you matter. There's no, uh, there's no race to become a consultant. There is no race to become a qualified GP. You are not a failure if you remain a trainee or a locum joker for forever, as you know, what, what we used to call it. I mean, it's there are there are no set paths. And I mean, frankly, the path I'm taking right now is a very roundabout path to, to doing what I felt I was <laughs> meant to be doing, which is actually, I guess, preventing from this sort of thing happening in the first place. So I don't want, I, I, I don't want um, you as an audience to get the impression that, you know, there must be ways where I can stay on this treadmill. Hmm. Can, this treadmill is something you can step on and step off. And frankly, it is a treadmill and it's, mm. it's hard. It's, it's not easy. The current training has a four monthly rotation, sometimes sending you to goodness knows where. But if it doesn't meet your circumstances and you know you're removing something from your own support network to sacrifice the training, just think you have a power of choice. How far are you willing to sell that power of choice? And then you start losing these things in your life, relationships, family, um, um, just friends, and just, just contact with other people, sleep. You, you've got to, these, your physical health, your mental health is, should take a priority because if you are able to actually look after those, you're going to be a better doctor. Mm -hmm. Be able to acknowledge it within yourself. You're able to look at, look, after patients in the same way. I think- um, There's a question here, Sarinda. Um, yeah. And um, that's about what advice would you give to yourself if you look back on your intercalated year, you know, when you started seeing your grades yes. there and your relationship become difficult, et cetera. Yeah. Balance. Balance is the key thing. If you're, having, um, if you're having mental health difficulties before you've actually met the clinical placement opportunities yet, it's still an opportunity to be open and talk with your colleagues about it because you can be sure that there are other people in the same boat. The key, key message here is that you're never alone. And a lot of universities now, thankfully, have good support services. So 
I mean, I was offered at the time, I was offered a counselor and I was seeing a consultant psychiatrist on a monthly basis, which was awesome. So you, you can get the help you need. You cannot get help if you're not open about it. And you, 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 there has to be a, a line where you realize I am not okay and mm. I need some help. And recognizing that is the first step and then being courageous. It, it, and it is courageous because you're overcoming fear mm. to talk, um, to talk with a supervisor, a um, I know I know someone who at the end of a lecture went up to the lecturer and just broke down. And then the lecture wow. that person to the, the support service and they they, they pass medicine, they're, they're thriving now. It's you I think we have to trust in, in humankind here a little bit too. I mean we're thank all, you, yeah. I mean that's a that's a good point. I think I think I didn't want us to lose that point that you made about being open, being kind to yourself but also being willing to be kind to others. And I think sometimes I think that that is, uh, you know, we, we see someone in distress, we see someone and then, you know, there's that reluctance to reach out to them. I think, I think we shouldn't underestimate the, the power of that simple human intervention. You know, I think even if you just ask someone, are you okay? That is that pivotal moment that might change things for them completely. Um, there are a couple of other questions, but I'm aware of time. I think, which is kind of similar, so you've answered them. Um, um, Eileen, are we going to do another poll at the end? Uh, but certainly I wanted to thank you while Eileen comes online. Uh, thank you so much for being so open and sharing your story. Um, I think reminding people that, that being open takes courage, but being aware of this and being willing to at least open up to someone so you can recognize issues, seeking help early, and then you know, reaching out to people and showing their kindness to yourself as you would to others is, is absolutely important. So, so thank you again. And, and anything you want to add, please feel free to do so as, as a final word uh, while oh, I well, sets up the poll. Um, thank you very much for all of you. For, thank you very much, Subo, for you know, just you know, guiding this conversation. I think the informality of what, you know, how we approach this is, I guess, for the audience, how I would like, how I would like to see conversations about this this sort of topic go. Just it's I'm speaking with you know the dean of the Royal College of Psychiatry. There's none of this. It doesn't feel at all like a hierarchy. It's not a. It's there's no fear in me talking about these things. I it's um, I I I'm in a place now where I'm doing things in life which I wish I had paid more attention to, um, and I think actually it leads back to the question about the pre clinical years and balance do not throw yourself 100 percent into into work you will actually end up being more productive and do better work and feel most importantly feel great about yourself if you've if you're committed yourself to other things sport meeting friends talking with your family spending time with your family actually is does unbelievable good and i think we tend to think that when we go to university we distance ourselves and we have the university experience we all need that that familiar love from family and i think that's that's a huge thing i'd recommend thank you Sandra. over to you eileen thank you thank you so much Bo. thank you surrender for being so candid with your story and experiences i'm sure it was um Really wonderful for all the participants to hear today. Um, so as we asked you just at the beginning of the session to share with us one word about how you were feeling um, about burnout, stress and mental illness amongst health workers, um, I'm just going to ask you in the chat again to just share with us a word um, that comes to mind after, after hearing today's session. And um, yeah, I, I'd like to add my thanks while people are just um, adding their uh, words into the chat. So this is this uh, webinar is part of um, four webinars that we're doing. We've got the we will send everybody who's um, joined today the dates uh, for next year when we have those confirmed. And there'll be a similar format, sort of Q and A um, interview type format, and. Um, 
yeah, just a, a big thank you again um, for being so open, Surinder. I, I'm sure it's all kind of very relatable and it, it's a big ask to, to do it. Thank you. It was really interesting for me um, to hear it as well. And um, yeah, as I, as I said at the beginning, this has all been recorded. So if um, anyone knows anyone that would be interested in it, we will share it. Uh, the link via email and you can share that with uh, your colleagues and also please again another plea to uh, follow us on social media and uh, share um, what you know of doctors in distress so thank you all again perfect thank you everyone hopefully see you at the next webinar thank you everyone thank you and thanks, Linda. Bye, bye, Irene. Bye. Thank you, guys. Cheers. Thank you. Yeah.